So I'm going to talk to you today about when I'll bail you out and when I won't. I have no disclosures on this. I'm going to talk briefly about when surgical backup is appropriate, when it's not appropriate, and I'm going to make a plea for a heart team support about this, heart team approach. A lot of this is based, I had the opportunity to be a participant on the 2011 Cabbage Guidelines where this, these topics were addressed, and I think these, the answers that came out from that or the guidelines that came out for that are really still apply today. So this was addressed, the concept of emergency cabbage after failed PCI. So in the guidelines, a level, uh, level a class one indication is recommended after failed PCI in the presence of ongoing ischemia or threatened occlusion with substantial myocardium at risk. And you've seen a bunch of cases today uh, where that's very, uh, very much essential. And so when you get an acute closure in the cath lab and there's clear ongoing ischemia, it's affecting a significant volume of myocardium and, has, and the patient is graftable, then these patients should have either some form of mechanical support, either balloon pump or impella, and then should go to urgently to the operating room for surgical revascularization. I firmly believe that, that we need to be providing that. I mean, the, there's a, when in the stent era, the, the number of patients that we take to the operating room now is low. It's less than a half a percent of inter interventions go to the operating room. And if you look at who's getting it, it's not just acute closures or perforations or things like that. But a lot, some of the patients that go urgently are patients who have very severe left main or three-vessel disease and no intervention is even done, but they need to go to the operating room as their first option. And that's, a, that's another thing that needs to be considered. There's, you can predict sometimes from the information you have who will need that. And it's certainly more common in the patients with three-vessel disease, the complex lesions or cardiogenic shock. And in, in, the, in people who have all of those classifications, all those factors, maybe may as high as 8 or 9%. But remember, patients who undergo emergently cabbage have a higher in-death cardiac death rates. It, it's, it may be as much as 10 times higher if you have to go to emergency surgery. That's been some of the reluctance of surgeons. So they don't want to, with public reporting, they don't want to hurt their, hurt their results, and it's a factor. So emergency cabbage is also recommended after failed PCI for hemodynamic com compromise. And we saw that in, uh, in Arnold's presentation, the patient in shock, and in uh, Naveen's presentation, too. Both these patients in shock, both requiring mechanical support. Uh, support. Now, in the guidelines, this is the first, the, the class one indication is if in patients without impairment of the coagulation system and without previous sternotomy. This is cases where the surgery, I think, has a better role than, than without those uh, situations, although it's perhaps less common now. But if there's hemodynamic compromise, these patients, I think, should have an intraortic balloon pump support or impella or tandem or even ECMO and then to get stabilized first. This enables time for the, heart, for the team, the surgical team, to be called in. We rarely have them you know, in, in hospital at that time. You have to get perfusionists in. You have to get surgical assistance in, things like that. But then they should go urgently to the operating room for surgical revascularization. And they'll often need ongoing left ventricular support, as you've seen in some of these cases today. And that's, that's where having that available. So after emergency bypass grafting, after acute myocardial uh, infarctions where there's shock, the, the surgical, mort the in-hospital mortality rate for those patients is as high as 20%. And in fact, when you get patients with the, with the most severe ca ca cases of support, it can be even higher of that. You also are taking risk in these patients. The vast majority will need transfusion, and there's a much higher incidence of renal failure, much higher inc incidence of stroke or neurologic compromise in these patients. And these are factors. Surgical teams think, of the, think about these things a lot as they're moving forward on their decisions to provide support. Another uh, a class 2A indication is emergency cabbage is reasonable after failed PCI for retrieval of a foreign body, like a fractured guide wire or a stent at a crucial anatomic location. I've only done one or two of these. They're pretty uncommon now, but you guys have got a lot more, uh, you know, toys that you're putting into the coronaries than I've ever seen before. But remember that we'll do this, but the operation is going to be more complicated because they'll need to make an, a coronary arteriotomy that may be longer or in an adverse place. And the grafting sites that we're going to do on that may, will need to consider that. And in, uh, in a review that was done in 2013 in current cardiology reviews, the, the number of reports of this is not high. And this is, uh, this is an example from that of a, a retained uh, piece of a, a guide wire in that thing. A great result, but unfortunately there's a guide wire still sitting in there. But one of the things to note is that many of these can actually be still extracted percutaneously. And in this, in this series, which is a review of the entire literature, surgical extraction was required about 43% of the time, and percutaneous retrieval, almost the same amount, was able to get these, uh, these fractured pieces back. And conservative therapy was used 15% of the time in these patients. That is an option in patients who aren't on, having ongoing ischemia. You don't like to leave a lot of stuff in there, but, but it, is a, it is an option. <clears throat> 
Now, emergency cabbage can be beneficial after failed PCI for hemodynamic compromise in patients who, where, the, where the coagulation system is impaired, and, but you've not had a previous sternotomy. So again, almost all these patients are getting lo loaded with antiplatelet air, uh, um, agents, and so they, they're getting Plavix, Prasagrel, often Coumadin. You've seen today Angiomax in, in uh, um, uh, Mazin's presentation, uh, direct thrombin. People come in with all kinds of stuff, or maybe even recent thrombolytics. I trained in the era of the TAMI trials, the TIMI trials, where we were getting, taking people to the operating room with this, and it wasn't pretty, but it still you could help a lot of people with that. But you have to remember that postoperative bleeding and transfusion rates and re-expiration rates will be very high in these patients. But I think it can still help people a lot. Now, in the standard guidelines in elective surgery, we generally recommend stopping Plavix five days in advance, Prasugal seven days in advance. But in patients for urgent cabbage, if we can, we like to discontinue these for at least 24 hours. And often it's a better plan to use things like ectopivotide, where they can be stopped maybe two or four hours prior to surgery if you can buy that amount of time. But emergency surgery has one of the highest predictors in, in all the uh, uh, multi, uh, multivariate analyses for the determinants of bleeding after surgery. And patients, you have to really plan that patients on these agents will need a transfusion. So we have to be careful in the Jehovah Witness patients, in the patients who do not have, uh, who have had previous transfusions and have a lot of antibodies and are going to be difficult to cross match. Those are factors, and that's again where a heart team approach can be very, very important. Now, emergency uh, cabbage might be considered after a uh, failed PCI in patients with hemodynamic compromise with a previous sternotomy. So this is like the patients that Rajiv presented and Naveen presented today, or sorry, that uh, Mauricio presented today, where they've had previous uh, corneal bypass surgery. Now, often the interventions are maybe done in the grafts, but there's, um, you, you know, but these are patients that are going to be at much higher risk and have additional challenges. There are, I've heard about a thousand different surgeons who have made the claim there are emergencies and there are redos, but there are no emergency redos. <laughs> and I guess, and for me, it's there are, should be few emergency redos because the problems with emergency redos is that the time to achieving reperfusion will be longer, and as because of the dissections required, and as a result, the results will be poorer. There's going to be a higher instance of perioperative bleeding and transfusion, and the optimal conduits may already have been used. Also, an open mammary, if it's not part of the, uh, of the problem, may be damaged during reentry. So there's a significantly higher risk in these patients. Now, in, in a, one recent study from the University of Pennsylvania, there was 160 patients who underwent urgent or emergent uh, cabbage. And the total mortality in this group was, was 7%. But if you looked at the patients who were actually in shock, it was much higher than that, bordering on 40%. And so the elective redo cabbage rate uh, over that time was only 3%. So these patients then pr propose a real problem for surgical uh, investigators. Now, when can't you have backup? All right. Well, emergency cabbage, again, from the guidelines, shouldn't be performed for failed PCI in the absence of ischemia or threatened occlusion. So if you don't have ongoing ischemia, no one's going to, I don't think anyone recommends that and no one would do it, but you shouldn't go to the uh, operating room in, in that setting. But more, a more important thing to consider is that it shouldn't be formed after failed PCI if the revascularization is impossible because of target anatomy or a no reflow state. So when patients have really severe anatomy that's just not going to be a, a good result, we should do other options for them. It may be including hemodynamic support and considering them for advanced therapies if necessary. The no reflow uh, uh, phenomenon is an important one because surgical mortality in that, in that setting is over 50%. And it's an uncommon thing. It can be sometimes a little difficult to define because the target vessel, you know, may still have residual disease in it. But it's a, the pathophysiology involves inflammation and um, myocardial edema and intravascular thrombus or, or embolization from the uh, intervention. And operating in that situation will not help these patients and shouldn't be offered. You also can't have backup. And this relates to uh, Arnold's case. If you're in a hospital that doesn't have cabbage program. And so the case that he, that he presented uh, was first sent to a, such a place. And, you know, some of the early results of uh, percutaneous coronary interventions at centers without coronary bypass grafting suggested that there was significantly worse outcomes in patients in, operated in those centers. And that's from the JAM article in, in 20, 2004, where in the, in the non, I think in, where most people would say that in an in emergency or a STEMI population, it was a reasonable thing to do. But in the elective situation, the results were worse. But more recent uh, evaluations of this from uh, meta-analysis of the data have now suggested that that is not necessarily the case. 
And uh, the results can be as good or not significantly different even in the non-salvage or the non-emergency situations in hospitals that do PCI but do not provide surgical support. And, you know, the expert consensus that came out in, in 2012 shows that now, and this was by 2013, only, in only one state was um, PCI without surgical backup uh, disallowed. And I think almost everywhere this is a, this is a phenomenon this is across the country. But I think that the real thing that I want to try to emphasize is that I, I'm a very big believer that there should be a heart team approach to revascularization de de decisions. It's part of the guidelines as a class one indication that the heart team approach should be is recommended in patients with unprotected left main and complex disease. When, in, when, when the syntax scores are available, they should be used to evaluate dissertation decisions. And the heart team can decide in advance who is and who is not a candidate for an emergency cabbage. And it can avoid controversy that comes up later on. It can reverse adverse outcomes. The Jehovah Witness patient, the patient that's very frail, the patient who does not under any circumstances want surgery, the patient with a limited life expectancy from other problems should be considered in that. You can also coordinate antiplatelet strategies. You can go to the operating room, use a adaptivified um, product that can be re reversed easier, making urgent surgery a more better option. And you can even make a decision to recommend cabbage over PCI in, in patients with high syntax scores, for example, which may, may benefit them in the long run. We have to also consider, as has been mentioned here, that public reporting is a big part of this. There's public reporting of cabbage programs almost uniformly. 98% of surgical programs report to the SDS database now. But now PCI programs report as well. And no one wants their results to, to look bad. But the heart team can take an active interest in the results of both the PCI and the cabbage programs, and the heart team should really recommend the revascularization strategy that's in the best interest of all these patients. And surgeons should want excellent outcomes for their center's uh, PCI program, and they should provide backup to achieve these best results. And interventionalists should want excellent outcomes for their center's cabbage program, and they should, survive, should strive to, to minimize salvage cases and to work to coordinate antiplatelet strategies and hemodynamic support options that are best for these high-risk patients. And these collaborative efforts, efforts should encompass more than just the PCI and CABG programs, but should include team-based strategies for surgical support of structural heart disease, and although that's not a topic here. Earlier this year, probably uh, an uh, example of the heart team approach was, came from an endeavor much, you know, much more important than medicine, and that was in NHL hockey in the Stanley Cup playoffs, where uh, number 29, Mark andre Fleury, was the, uh, primary, was the primary operator or, back, uh, or the primary goalie for the Pittsburgh Penguins. He was backed up by Matt Fleury, shown as, uh, shown as here. But uh, during the Stanley Cup playoffs, after game four of the Eastern Conference Finals against Ottawa, he, there was an uh, adverse outcome for the uh, primary operator, so they switched to the backup, and that ended up leading to them uh, gain, re re winning that conference and actually winning the Stanley Cup that year. So with a good backup system, great things can happen, and really everybody can win in this. So again, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you Michael. That was a super presentation. And We'll take a couple of questions from the audience. Are there any data on the number of emergency cabbages? Are those declining? The perception seems, from our standpoint, is that maybe they're declining in their instance. So they've clearly de de declined over the years. The biggest drop was after stenting, when acute closure rates fall. The number of redo operations in the country, based on the SDS database, is continuing to decline, too, although that pre probably has stabilized right now. But that's the, the, biggest, the biggest area of controversy in this is, uh, or I mean, I think that, uh, I think that the, the biggest area of change has been in the number of redos. People are trying, saying, okay, if you've had a surgical revascularization, we'll go to PCI first. But the number of emergency cases overall seems to be dropping. It's around 0.3% or less in most centers now. Great. And I think uh, my other uh, maybe final comment or question is the left main multivessel disease, the heart team approach uh, at, at your institution, are those patients being routinely taken off the table and, and presented in a multidisciplinary format? We try, we, we, try, we try to as much as possible. In a patient with an acute coronary syndrome, if he, has, if he had trunk left main disease and, and ST segment changes, I tell them, open that up. Do, because you can open it up much faster than we can getting them into the operating room. But a patient with complex disease who we think we can put a balloon pump in, the pain, chest pain is going away, ST segments are resolving, that's the one we like to try to do a uh, heart team approach on as much as you possibly can. Fair enough. Great. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers.